Welcome uh, to the third of our Wednesday workshops for the 2021 Leadership Alliance Virtual Professional Development Series. Today's workshop will focus on pathways to health equity. I am Damani Piggott, Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. I was asked by the Leadership Alliance uh, just to share a bit about myself. I graduated from Mohos College with a degree in biology and Spanish, then obtained my PhD degree in immunology and my medical degree from Yale University. I did clinical residency training in internal medicine and pediatrics at Yale and fellowship training in infectious diseases and epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. I currently serve as assistant dean for graduate biomedical education and graduate student diversity at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and direct the Johns Hopkins University Vivian Thomas Scholars Initiative. I also currently serve on the Inclusion, Diversity, Access and Equity Task Force of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. And I very much look forward to moderating today's panel. This event is a component of the Leadership Alliance Virtual De Professional Development Series. This series was envisioned and created by Leadership Alliance partners to help participants better understand research, why we do it, how it can be done, and the ways in which it can transform the world. This series would not be possible without the work of my colleagues at Brown University, Shamnad University in Honolulu, Weill Cornell Medical College, Vanderbilt University, and Xavier University of Louisiana. To those colleagues, my colleagues, thank you for your efforts in creating this program. So before we begin today's conversation, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome today's panel. First, Dr. Emily Bembenek developed a keen understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of higher education as a first generation college student which led to a strong interest in how to bridge equity gaps. After receiving her undergraduate degree, Dr. Bembenek then completed her PhD at the University of Michigan, investigating how storytelling in both digital and analog environments share insights for how humans understand the world and each other. After receiving her PhD, Dr. Bembenek went on to the University of Chicago to work on strategic initiatives focused on educational access and technological advancement. She now leads the Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence at the University of Chicago Booth, helping to drive research in machine learning to reduce bias and increase equitable outcomes for all. Welcome, Dr. Bambanek. Dr. Katrina Claw is a member of the Dine Navajo tribe is an assistant professor in the Division of Biomedical Informatics and Personalized Medicine at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. She's on faculty with the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine and the Human Medical Genetics and Genomics Program at the University of Colorado. Broadly, her research program focuses on personalizing medicine, using genetic information and biomarkers for tailored treatment, pharmacogenomics, and the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomic research with American Indian and Alaska Native and other indigenous communities around the world. Dr. Claw's current research includes studying cytochrome P450 genetic variation, tobacco cessation, and nicotine metabolism, evolutionary medicine, and examining the perspectives of genomic research in native communities. Dr. Claw grew up on the Navajo Nation. She obtained her BS uh, degree in biology and BA in anthropology at Arizona State University and her PhD in genome sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle in 2013. Dr. Claw was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Washington with the Northwest Alaska Pharmacogenomics Research Network before she moved to, to Colorado. Welcome, Dr. Claw. Dr. Melissa Vifos is a board certified radiation oncologist who is a visiting adjunct assistant professor at the University of Maryland Medical Center. She was born and raised in Washington, DC to Dominican immigrant parents. She attended UMBC as a Mayhoff scholar 
graduating with a BS in biochemistry and subsequently enrolled in the MSDP program, MD-PhD program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She earned her PhD in biochemistry in 2012 and finished a residency in radiation oncology in 2019. During her training, she published over 20 manuscripts and developed a passion for cancer disparities and designing pragmatic clinical interventions to promote health equity in historically marginalized patient groups. She currently holds grants from the American Cancer Society to determine the effects of food deserts on cancer care and outcomes at her institution and is leading additional protocols directed at investigating cancer disparities, including improving the enrollment of black women into breast cancer clinical trials. She regularly mentors undergraduates, medical students and residents while being an active member of ASTRO's Committee on Health Equity, Diversion and Diversity and Inclusion, as well as serving as chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Maryland. She currently lives in PG County with her husband, two kids and a dog. She's an avid runner and practices wushu, a form of Chinese martial arts. Welcome, Dr. Bikos. Dr. Bembenek, Dr. Klo, and Dr. Vifos, thank you again for being here. Uh, I'd really like to begin the conversation, if I might, by hearing from all of you, what does health equity mean to you and why do you consider it to be important? It, I can uh, answer that. <laughs> That's okay, I'll start. Um, you know, health equity is such a, a very simple concept, um, but it means so much, especially to, um, you know, historically marginalized uh, groups in our country. So what it means is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy um, as they possibly can be. And, and of course, this requires removing such obstacles such as, um, uh, racial discrimination, poverty, lack of education, lack of healthcare access. And, and it's so important um, in our society, I mean, because we see ram ramifications of not having health equity every day, increased risk of um, uh, Black patients, Indigenous uh, populations dying from chronic illnesses. I mean, the COVID pandemic, as we'll probably get into later on, has kind of really showed the effects of the lack of health equity um, in our country. So it just means increased morbidity and mortality uh, for our, our the rest of our American brothers and sisters. And, and, and that's why I think it's very important that we continue to work towards achieving health equity in our country. I'll, I'll jump in and, and just add that I think one of the ways that um, improving medical equity helps us all is that it also improves faith in the system that we could actually make it work for everyone and that in itself has a has a huge effect. Um, we've seen, especially in the vaccination rollout, that there's a lot of um, distrust, well-earned distrust in the system. and. Um, it can be really difficult to overcome that even when, um, even in situations where um, distrust isn't currently warranted because there has been so much um, inequity. Uh, I think faith and trust in the system is, is something we really need to work on as well. Yes, I agree with the other two panelists, I think that when we think about health equity, we really have to think about the intersection of socio-cultural, historical, political, and economic factors in how people's health, um, um, health stands within their communities, within their families. Great, 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 uh, great way to start uh, our panel today. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, pick up on one theme, looking at the questions that have come in, and we very much appreciate uh, the depth and breadth of questions, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can uh, during this session uh, today. Uh, appreciably, uh, 
one of the pieces uh, that was just mentioned is thinking about the COVID-19 right uh, pandemic and uh, which is very much impacted all of our lives across so in so many different manifestations and forms um, over the last uh, 16 plus months. And as youth consider uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us uh, and perhaps as was alluded to brought to light pre-existing challenges for us uh, across multiple domains. I just wondered how uh, just have you appreciated health equity through the lens of the pandemic? Uh, picking up on the questions that are coming in. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So I think um, one of the things that, that became very clear to us has to do with the way that funding was distributed for COVID-19 relief to different hospitals and organizations. Um, we, we do a lot of work at the, at the policy level, so less at the individual patient level, but more on, um, in the realm of widely used algorithms and policies directed around health. And we saw that a common mistake was made in the way funding was distributed, in that instead of thinking about what communities really need funding and how can we best direct it to them, the decision was made using a proxy of revenues. So which hospitals um, have the highest revenues, they're going to in, have the most funding directed to them in this assumption that spending more um, meant that there were more needs there. And it, it does make sense in a, in a way <laughs> that you, if you're spending more money, you're, you're providing more healthcare, so there is more need for healthcare. But there are also situations, of course, where lower expenditures um, equate to a much lower um, cost per patient. And so instead of using something that was closer to reality, this broad assumption about how cost affects everyone the same led to a very um, inequitable relief of COVID funding. Um, that's one example. So from my experience, um, just going back to my field of personalizing medicine, and I'm sure many people have heard of personalized medicine or precision medicine as buzzwords the last couple of years, but these are emerging fields that really use genomics and big data technologies to provide targeted interventions at the individual and population level. But when in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, these precision health technologies such as genomics and other high throughput biomarkers could be deployed, but this wasn't um, really addressing the whole picture. And so since then, people have started coining the term precision public health because without the public health aspect um, coupled with precision medicine, then you're not going, you're not addressing the right problem. So um, when we think about genetic susceptibility to infection, so it, even though it's likely that some people are um, susceptible to infection, this doesn't really explain, the genetic differences aren't really the important part of why the virus is impacting different social groups. Um, differently. This really goes to the public health aspect, and um, it really brought to light how public health is an important part of many of these intervention strategies and um, relating to COVID-19. I think with precision uh, personalized medicine, we can use some of the technologies to aid in surveillance and uh, investigation and also look at transmission and uh, help develop vaccines, but um, in the end, really the big, one of the uh, really important aspects was looking at public health. And um, just to kind of add on um, to those uh, two very important points, um, I think the COVID pandemic really, really amplified uh, pre-existing economic inequalities in at least our patient population that we've seen here. Um, you know, people lost their jobs, therefore lost their insurance, uh, decreasing uh, household income, increasing food insecurities. And so what we've seen, at least anecdotally at our institution, in that year and a half span, you know, patients are presenting with more advanced cancers. You know, we're not just seeing that stage one breast cancer that's easily 99% curable people don't come in until their breast cancer has 
essentially traveled to other parts and 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 we it was really just this uh very clearly seen during the pandemic that you know people were people were struggling and disproportionately minorities were were really struggling and and that was very uh clearly reflected in their health care um uh, a lot of patients presented with more advanced disease unable to didn't have insurance so we had to kind of figure out new ways to treat them with shorter treatment regimens in terms of radiation oncology um, you know where it could take up to five to six weeks to treat someone you know because of that that sort of uh, decrease uh, of income or not having insurance we had to find a way to decrease their treatment uh, and so this year really kind of um, really shone light in how how just uh, unequal it is in this country in terms of um, uh, economic resources and, and us as physicians, how what we had to do to provide our, our, our patients with, with good and good quality care in light of that, in spite of that. Um, so hopefully moving forward, uh, this COVID pandemic, at least some good will come of it, I hope, that we can start help, uh, we can aggressively um, uh, mitigate those inequalities. And actually, to follow up with that, I really like that um, you mentioned um, some of the strengths um, and things that would help us in the future from this COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, one of the things that really was highlighted, especially in the Indigenous and communities and my own community, the Navajo Nation, was the strength of community-driven interventions. Um, the Navajo Nation at the start of the pandemic was one of the hardest hit communities in the United States and, and, and in fact, in most of the world um, based on their population, the number of people in the population. But this really turned around a, a couple months into the pandemic in which the tribe really took uh, control of all of the interventions, translated a lot of the materials into the Navajo language, made uh, imaging culturally appropriate, and contacted individuals um, through avenues where they would be able to see this through uh, billboards, through the local radio station, as well as social media. So I think, and now when we look at the Navajo Nation, it about over 90% of the Navajo people have been vaccinated and um, a lot of the social distancing and preventative measures are still in place. So I think we can take some positive from this in that we know that um, community driven interventions do work and are very strong and powerful for our communities. Great, great. So uh, if I could pick up on that last point, and uh, definitely, uh, Dr. Chloe, it's uh, very heartwarming to hear about the vaccination rates uh, in the Navajo Nation, uh, having uh, appreciated definitely how uh, uh, substantive a toll that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection has had on the Navajo Nation, and um, as Dr. Weiss was uh, mentioned has had on uh, communities that have been long vulnerable uh, to uh, st stresses, right, uh, across so many different aspects of things. And I do wonder um, if you could reflect, if you all can reflect just in, in general about, um, I, Dr. Weifus, I think you started to talk a bit about this, about sort of the cross-translational messages, cross cross-translational lessons um, that we have gained from the pandemic and pandemic response uh, that could translate into other historical uh, areas as well uh, in in this space uh, that you might consider as well. I'm just thinking about one of the other questions that was asked here. So non, so maybe I, to be a little bit more. Um, specific on that is uh, clearly we had a time um, uh, SARS or without uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? Um, and as we look towards um, the future, uh, with, while looking towards the past of the pre-COVID era uh, and the fa factors that existed then, um, what are the, the um, translational pieces that you think uh, might come uh, that might sustain, I guess, uh, or we, we could potentially sustain uh, going forward. Uh, 
I mean, that's that's a, a, a very <laughs> tough question. I think I think one of the things that was remarkable, it, specifically in my field in radiation oncology, um, is how to make treatments, you know, uh, remain effective, uh, still maintains low toxicity, and how do we de decrease the financial burden of these treatments to our patients, particularly those who uh, come from um, uh, poor socioeconomic background. And I think one of the ways that we are doing that moving forward as a, uh, as a, um, as a field is shortening radiation treatments. You know, during the COVID pandemic, we've had a lot of articles spitting out, you know, if you have a patient with prostate cancer, you could decrease their treatments from like eight weeks to four weeks, even if they're high risk. And, and, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, this is happening. And we know that four weeks of treatment is just as good as eight weeks. So why aren't we offering four weeks as standard of care now? You know, and, and it's moving in that direction. I think sort of what we call hypofractionating or, or decreasing the, or increasing the amount of radiation we give at a day to finish uh, treatments earlier is something that we're definitely adopting and that we're keeping as a field. And in the long term, decreases uh, transportation needs uh, uh, for our patients, decreases the financial toxicity of our patients while maintaining that same sort of um, equal cancer uh, cure rate and uh, toxicity. So that's something that we're definitely going to keep moving forward. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but that's an example uh, in, in my field in particular. Now, I would say like, so we work in AI and equity sort of broadly, so not just healthcare. And I think that everything that happened last year, so not just the pandemic, but also what happened with George Floyd and the many protests and, and conversations that came out of, of those events last year, really highlighted for people who aren't in those communities, but who may be generally decent people, that there's a big problem. And I think that the, with the funding problem I mentioned, this would, these were people trying to make the right choice, but doing it in a poor way because they had problematic baseline assumptions. And that's what we see happening with AI all over the place. And I think what's, what we can take away from this and, be, and think of positively is that it's, it's actually the best time for this to happen because there's so much innovation that everyone's both trying to figure it out, trying to regulate, trying to understand. And then we have this cultural moment of, um, of I don't know, recognition, I hope. And, and those two together have really given us the interest at a broad scale that's allowed us to make advances in research that we can then apply into actual industry. And I'm not sure that would have happened without the pandemic really bringing all these inequities to light. Great, great. Um, so thinking about that um, additionally, I'm going to one of the questions that is here, uh, which uh, asked about um, how do you think uh, well-structured systems of public healthcare would prevent uh, future uh, infections like this uh, in uh, various uh, spaces. Uh, and maybe I'll just open that up to uh, even broader. Uh, beyond infections, uh, how would well structured systems of healthcare, uh, public healthcare, uh, actually uh, leverage and move the needle forward in terms of uh, advancing health equity? Once again, very tough question. <laughs> um, tough questions from students. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so, uh, sorry, just to kind of just to kind of repeat, how is um, these? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question from the from that was raised was how do we think uh, well structured systems of public healthcare could actually be leveraged to prevent future infectious diseases? Uh, in uh, various uh, places. Uh, and I, I just was, was opening that up to say, thinking beyond infection, uh, potentially, how do you think well-structured systems of public health care might uh, have 
positive force in terms of advancing health equity? You know, I, just to answer the first part of the question, um, and then I'll leave it to my colleagues to, to, to chime in. You know, a lot of institutions, uh, restaurants, uh, from all levels of, 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 of work uh, were had to employ or had to come up with health policies to keep not only patients safe, but colleagues safe, coworkers safe. And so we have these policies already in place for if heaven forbid another infection like uh, COVID-19 were to happen, we already have these things in place to prevent it. And I think, you know, um, uh, you know, hopefully we're, we're, we're a very smart country in that, you know, if something like this were to happen again, we have those policies in place to nip it in the bud and we know what to do to prevent it. Um, in terms of how, uh, a well-organized public health system can um, help improve health equity. I, I think when I think of well-organized public health system, I, I think of something that uh, is eradicated or, or something like structural racism is eradicated. Um, you know, structural racism is something that indirectly damages health uh, and health equity by uh, undermining a lot of strategies that may allow for minority patients to be cared for, uh, physicians and research scientists and things like that, that fully understand their culture and their background. And, and so when, when I imagine a, a healthcare system that's organized to a point where it, health equity is improved, it, it can't happen without structural racism being addressed and removed entirely. Um, and how we do that is something that we are trying to figure out how to do. A, a lot of uh, academic centers and, 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 and I'm pretty sure Hopkins is, 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 is doing the same where a lot of effort is uh, being placed to train physicians, nurses, healthcare providers on unconscious, on unconscious bias and how we can mitigate that to improve patient care. I, I mean, those are just some of the beginning stages of things to address this sort of bigger issue of, of, of structural racism in this country. Um, so that's kind of how my thought process was in answering that question. Yeah, I definitely think this is a tough question to answer, but just from my perspective, I think definitely we do have to address structural racism and there's just a ton of historical distrust in so many different communities. Um, such that I know from my personal experience in my community, a lot of people don't even go to the doctors until it is, it, they absolutely must have to, and they're in pain, they've been in pain for weeks, that's the only way they will go to the doctor. And this is because there has been so much mistrust and distrust within the community and, um, malpractice within when people visit the hospital. So I think we definitely need to address that, but also access to healthcare. A lot of communities don't even have that access, um, especially rural isolated communities. There might, you might have to drive hours to go to the nearest hospital or in, if you need uh, specialized care, that's even more uh, time away from home as well as um, uh, getting access to that, but but definitely it's a tough question to answer. Um, but I think that um, the more we talk about this, and hopefully will uh, change things in the future. And, and I think to pick piggy off of what Dr. Claw was saying, um, this sort of distrust or mistrust between patients and these marginalized uh, groups of, of, of American citizens or, or, or groups in this country and physicians and healthcare providers is something that's just just intertwined in our history. Um, and, and, and I think one of the ways to really promote health equity um, is to diversify health professionals. You know, uh, I, I read something from AMA the other day that 65% of academic doctors, physicians are, 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 are white Americans, and only 5% were, were, or I'm sorry, 3% were Black, and 3.2% and were from the Latinx community, and despite the fact that, you know, uh, Latinos make up 18% of the U.S. population, 13% of the U.S. population are, are, are Black Americans, and, and, and so we really need to diversify the health 
community, the health professional uh, professionals and any sort of um, interventions or policies to help promote that need to be forthcoming and, and, and on the forefront. Yeah, this is such a big question that it's difficult to really um, get to the core of it. I, I think it's still not clear to many people how intertwined structural racism is with everything else that's wrong with the healthcare system. Like I was in a talk yesterday about how this association of costs and health has really had a great harm on diverse populations because there's an assumption everyone costs the same amount for healthcare. And someone asked me, well, why would a white person um, generate more costs? And I said, but at first I had to, you know, remember that not everyone deals with this on a daily basis, right? A lot of people don't understand that access is a real problem, that going to the doctor is not something everyone does on a normal basis. Um, like doc, Dr. Vifehouse, I think was saying about, or, or maybe it was Dr. Claw, how people in, in communities go at the last minute. And this shows up in our data. And it's not because they're not sick, or it's not because they don't need care, it's because the communities don't have access to care, they don't trust care, the care doesn't treat them equally. Like there are so many problems in the system itself that, that we need to look at it as a whole and figure out what interventions we can make that can affect everything because they're all intertwined. There's no way to separate one thing and like, oh, if we structure the healthcare system better, it will solve the problem. You know. It might help the problem, but the problem is big and we have to look at it from all those different perspectives. Great, thank you. So I wanna toggle a bit. We've spent some time talking about some of the challenges, right? Um, uh, that exist both contemporaneously and historically, uh, both uh, through the COVID lens and the non-COVID lens. And I wanted to, uh, toggle to one question that I think uh, is looking towards the future in the context of those who are here with us today. So the question is, how could one get into professional research about disparities in healthcare and systems and um, uh, can educational programs help to advance uh, health equity uh, and, uh, in any areas of the US? So I think I can start out with this um, since I've definitely benefited from a lot of the educational programs throughout my ac academic journey. So as an undergrad, I was in the MARC program and then I finished and uh, as a post -bac, I went into the PREP program, which is, which is the post-baccalaureate research education program. And then as a graduate student, I attended SACNIS meetings, ACES meetings. So I don't know if these acronyms, many people are familiar with them, but these are all program, educational programs and national organizations that are designed to really connect you with research opportunities, um, whether this is in health disparities or any other um, biomedical research field that you're interested in, but I've definitely benefited from them. And even as an early career faculty, there are programs for individuals out there looking to gain a little bit more training on different topics. Um, but just to mention, there is a whole division in the National Institutes of Health dedicated to health disparities. This is the NI National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and they are funding grants that are specifically related to minority health and health disparities. Um, and then just quickly, um, I googled different summer programs and health disparities. There are so many out there. There's the well, I'll just say Nebraska Summer Health Research Program. It's geared for minority health disparities. There's one at Hopkins. Um, there's a tribal community summer internship. So there are a ton of opportunities out there and I'm happy to help anyone if they're interested in uh, looking at different opportunities. 
And, and I agree with Dr. Claw 100%. I, you know, as a Meyerhoff scholar at UMBC, and also I was a Mark U Star scholar as well. Um, I don't know if Dr. Claw remembers, but I think we were at NYU one summer together. I did go to SACNIS. Did you go to NYU once? Yeah, it, 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 it was a summer program uh, as, as well. So there's a lot of um, uh, resources available, like Dr. Claw was saying, and, and a very small world <laughs> in, in, in the health uh, field. But um, in another aspect of things, does educa do educational programs help uh, decrease or increase health equity? And I, I think from another perspective, a lot of medical schools are trying to, are starting to train their medical students very, very early on how ways that we can sustain behavioral changes to mitigate unconscious bias and how we did and how we interact with our colleagues, how we interact with our patients. And when we um, help mitigate those sort of unconscious biases that we everyone has, um, at the end of the day, we provide better care for our patients. And, and that's something that uh, I think a lot of med students or a lot of medical schools are just sort of ingraining into their educational system. We shouldn't just look at it as a separate thing, okay, now you're going to take one class on health equity or one class on unconscious bias. We, we inter, 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 uh, weave it into the actual uh, medical educational um, track. And that's, and then we, or we, we train doctors who are prepared to go out and serve underserved communities um, with, a lot, with love, compassion, and, 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 and no biases at all, and very limited biases. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, that's going to really make the change we need to see to help improve health equity, is to train our physicians to think that way. I would also encourage students to reach out to the centers at your school, or um, you see some research or hear about a faculty member who's doing something that's interesting to you, talk to them, reach out to them. Like, I have lots of students reach out to me or just like, I would like to get involved. And you know, we often have them get involved in some way. And um, there, I think like I probably represent the, the alternative to being in med school or being in the public health school and that you can be in the social sciences or, it, or in the business school. There's so many ways to have an impact on this that, you know, wherever your strengths lie, I'm sure that, that there's a way to get involved if you put yourself out there and, and, and um, ask for the opportunities we, we have them and are happy to share. Great. So uh, I would take away two things from that very rich uh, piece there that was shared. One is that uh, you never know who you might come back and see again, whether in the Zoom screen, <laughs> in a box, or in person somewhere as well. And uh, I think that speaks to uh, definitely, I can say, from my own journey, having been through uh, a lot of similar programs as well myself from the Leadership Alliance on, uh, that uh, uh, the networks that you form in those spaces as well. I would just encourage all of you to hold on strong to the folks that you're meeting this summer uh, as well, right? Because uh, you're going to go forward in joint uh, journey with similar mission, I'm sure in a lot of different spaces uh, to actually advance the whole, right? And so uh, as we talk about how how the training environment can advance uh, these systems and think about it on the individual level, uh, very much would think about it also on the joint unison level, uh, like Dr. Mike Boss and Dr. Klo being at NYU, <laughs> and and uh, right and now in this space. Um, so uh, definitely, and then as Dr. Bambanek mentioned, I think the other thing definitely to highlight very strongly is sort of the multidisciplinary approach and how all hands on deck. And uh, I, I talk about um, this Ethiopian proverb that states. Uh, uh, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion, and each of those webs doesn't have to be the same. They can all be of different colors and shapes and forms, and uh, uh, in fact, that actually makes the net even stronger uh, in terms of tying up the lion. So uh, all of you and all the different paths that you might go through are going to bring tremendous value um, to this space as well. So which carries me to the next question that was raised uh, in the question sheet. Uh, so. Uh, it actually toggles a bit, uh, it's related to the question before, maybe with a slight twist. Um, I think uh, the question before we talked about what are the spaces where we can actually um, train in terms of professional research bit. Uh, this question asks uh, maybe a little bit more um, 
uh, open-ended, what can we do as students to raise awareness for health uh, inequity uh, as it addresses uh, uh, people of color, other historically underrepresented groups, other vulnerable groups, other marginalized groups. Um, what can we do um, as students uh, to, to raise awareness? Um, so I'll jump in. I've, I think students have an incredibly powerful voice that their, their passion and their way of, of telling their stories can really have an effect on their peer group, but also those older than them. And I think like they can communicate in ways that, you know, the center is, is less capable of. They can form relationships that may be harder for, for an institution or for a physician to do. I think that students have a really fundamental role to play in, in just expressing their voice and their experiences and really making that loud. Um, I've also had students be incredibly helpful in just telling, telling me specifically, here are the people we wanna hear from. Here, here are the individuals that we think should be highlighted. Here's who you should invite. Like, um, I think that honestly, student voices are just the most incredible thing and, and don't, um, don't dis disvalue them. Um, make sure you know how much your voice is worth. No, I, I agree 100%. And, and I'm trying to think of um, some, some of the things that we did as, as medical students or when I was a student, you know, how we can try to promote health equity. And, and one of the things that we did, just practically speaking, you know, I went out to a lot of community churches and um, especially in the Latinx community, um, when the uh, HPV vaccine came out, there was a lot, there was a huge hesitancy in the Latino community to pursue it. And so one of the things that we did to try to educate, you know, is to actually have, you know, Spanish speaking doctors go out, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was born here, but I'm Dominican. So I, I am a native Spanish speaker. So I went out to a lot of these community churches and I spoke to them about the importance of HPV vaccine. There was a lot of misconceptions about it. So just going out and, and educating your community about certain important health issues is something that you can practically do. Um, organize events on campus to, you know, to help, uh, you know, uh, uh, health literacy is very, very important. Um, doing advocacy work, you know, in, in DC, if, if you're close to it, or in, in your hometown, uh, to help promote uh, changing policies from anti-racist or to racist from anti, uh, uh, help improving uh, racist policies is something that you can practically do. Um, it's a lot of work and it can be daunting at times, uh, but, you know, your voice matters. Um, and going out and doing things like this, it, it, at the end of the day, it, it does help. Every little bit does. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that um, not only going out and teaching the community, but also learning from the community themselves, because there's a lot that we don't know about specific um, things that are happening within the community, um, as well as just making sure this is bi-directional, that you're not just teaching those members, but you're also learning. But I think what's really great is from this is that often I'll go into a lot of, I do a lot of outreach with different um, native communities. And often I'm, I, I'm the only, I'm the very first doctor uh, that they've met or a person who's gone through a PhD program. A lot of people don't know what that entails. And so it's really uplifting to go out into community and uh, talk to people just just to show that I'm a normal person like everyone else. <laughs> and I enjoy watching sappy rom-coms. So I think just uh, lowering that visor or I don't know what you call it, just making sure they know you're a normal person and you experience these things and we're able to um, get a, go into a, a doctoral program as well. But I also think that um, for those um, individuals who are not people of color or of a historically underrepresented group, I think that one way that has been really powerful for allies to um, 
raise awareness is to educate yourself and not rely on the brown person in the room to bring up these issues, but you can bring them up yourself and uh, take the pressure off of the um, individuals um, um, who may or may not be present. So. And this is not just for students, but for everyone. Great. Um, so uh, as we just to take off, uh, so uh, there's a point here at the docs. Um, uh, I find it interesting on how indigenous belief of giving back to the community is tied to the Western thought of medicine. Uh, I've never thought of using medicine to study the genetics of native people and create a treatment specifically designed for tribal nations. Uh, just the question is about any potential elaboration on, on that idea. Uh, this part. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's a lot of what I do. I think that in any community, we can personalize medicine. I think when people think personalized medicine, they think of these high-tech genomic technologies, but really it's not necessarily like that. You can go into communities now, um, some tribal uh, hospitals are run by the tribe and they're able to get a cultural uh, person into your treatment regimen. So they try to treat people holistically. And um, so I think that's one way of personalizing medicine, not just using genomic data. But I specifically got interested in genetics um, because of the different variation I was finding in various populations. Um, and specifically with in relation to pharmacogenomics, which is um, looking at different enzymes that metabolize drugs. Um, and there's really a small subset of genes that metabolize most of the drugs that people take. And what we're finding is that many, many different populations have different frequencies and variations that um, might affect what drugs they can take or the dosages they can take. So, and a lot of these same um, enzymes, um, or when you think about it, all, a lot of these drugs that were developed were drugs were developed from indigenous plants and indigenous uh, uh, things in the environment. So I think that's one way of thinking of how we're taking um, some indigenous knowledge and um, using it now in personalizing medicine. Great, thanks Dr. Flo. So uh, there's, a, there's a question actually that uh, I see here uh, that relates to uh, AI or machine learning uh, actually. Uh, and the question uh, speaks uh, to what are the lessons? Uh, I know Dr. Bambanak, you mentioned George Floyd and others. Uh, there's a question about sort of what the lessons uh, in AI or machine learning that we've gained potentially from the challenges that have uh, uh, we've witnessed or borne witness to over the last um, year or so. Yeah, I, um, I think overall, we've had relatively positive lessons, at least in the research community. Um, I think that in the, in the common understanding of AI, there's a sense that, that it, it's a very black and white kind of approach to AI, that it's either um, biased or it's unbiased. But in fact, AI algorithms, machine learning um, reflect the human world. They reflect our systems because of two things. One, um, the data that it comes from, that the data that the algorithm has comes from the system. And two, the algorithm is made by a human being. Now, what we've mostly seen is that, you know, all these problems that came to light, especially over the pandemic and, and during the, all of the um, discourse around racial justice, um, are typically the problems we see are not intentional. There's no intent to make biased AI, but in a way that's more insidious and more dangerous because it means that that any any algorithm um, can result in these biased results. And I and I often get questions both from from the public and from technical people like, well, if we just don't tell the algorithm the race someone is, it can't be biased, right? Well, no, that's not true because the bias isn't isn't in people's skin. The bias is in the system and the bias is in how people treat each other. And so, and the algorithm, the algorithm doesn't know that. The algorithm just has, you know, this data, this data from the system. It just has 
has information. And so when we say to an algorithm, like we want to treat white people and black people the same, sometimes it can help to tell it who the white people and the black people are or, or any other race. I'm using white and black is very um, simplified here. Um, and, and I think that what we've learned is that there's a there's a way to fix it or a way to mitigate it is a better way to say that. Um, and we've seen generally a really positive and encouraging attitude from healthcare systems and insurance companies about this, that they, they want to make the system better and help working to do that is um, a very long and arduous job, but it is possible. And I think that's a really hopeful perspective. And it's, it's more complicated than just bias or unbiased, but it also means that there's a way to get better and a way to make incremental progress that can really have an effect on everyone's lives. Great. Um, so I appreciate we're coming to uh, the end of the hour. Uh, we have a, about five minutes or so left and I wanted to uh, get in one last question before I ask a kind of closing question that came from the audience uh, questions. So uh, one is, I guess this goes back, I think, to just looking at the Q and A, uh, the question of, of trust in systems and um, how do we approach health equity in communities uh, that have uh, felt mistrust uh, within the system uh, uh, in terms of thinking about how they might receive uh, considerations of procedures or receive medical care if there is that fair uh, potentially that that might exist. Um, I think that is a, a fantastic question and something that we are um, attempting to rectify every day and, and, and the achievement of health equity in communities uh, that have been mistreated in our country it, it takes time and it is a battle that has to be fought on many different fronts. And I think one of the ways we can help fight that battle and win is like what I mentioned before, diversifying our health staff. Um, a lot of research has shown that patients will uh, trust their physicians a lot more if they look like them, if they can understand where they're from, understand their culture, understand their language. And of course, that can, can't always happen, so um, making sure that you involve, and this is what I do in my practice, I make sure that my patients and their families are involved in making decisions. One of the things I always say to my patients is, you know, this is your body, you know it better than anyone else. I am here to provide you with the information you need to make a well-informed decision on your care. Let's work together to do that. So making sure that patients feel empowered, making sure that they are a part of that conversation of their own care uh, and not talking over them is, is some of the, of, of the things I teach my medical students and my residents. Um, and also just keeping in mind that, you know, anytime you, you reach uh, or, or speak to a person, especially uh, patients from the Latinx community, you know, uh, res being respectful, being compassionate, having a loving and caring demeanor goes a long way. And making sure that you are uh, open and truthful about uh, their care because any mistrust or any miscommunication can just break that fragile bond. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how I approach it and, and what we're continually working on, at least at our institution. Great, great. So uh, thanks, Otto So what I would like to do in the last uh, uh, couple minutes that we have uh, is each, if, if each of you can uh, take, uh, this is also from our students, uh, can take uh, one or both uh, uh, in combination or separately of these two questions uh, to close us off. So uh, the first is, what can those of us who are not in the health field do to uh, advance uh, the considerations around health equity? So that's question one. Uh, and the second is, if there was a nugget of information that you could pop into everyone's heads what would it be? Both are fair game, either are fair game. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just gonna to respond to that second part and I'll leave the first part and the second part to, to my colleagues. But if, if there was one nugget of information, I would say that for everyone to be aware of is that black lives matter. You know, and, 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 and I, 
and it's such a simple three word phrase that just means so much. And, and not saying that Black Lives Matter more than our indigenous population and more than the Latinx community, but once we realize that, you know, these marginalized groups that their lives are mat that their lives matter and that they're an important part of our country, then healthcare and have health equity will be improved for everyone. So I, that's sort of my nugget that I like to put in everyone's head in our country, <laughs> if I could. I mean, it's hard to talk that, but um, I would say like, I, I mean, it's hard to settle on one. So maybe like the first one is, is internal, you know, challenge your own assumptions. I think they're often not correct. And then the second one is external. Listen, listen to patients, especially. Um, we've learned so much by doing those in tandem. You know, you challenge this pain index, for example, that turns out to have been developed on primarily white patients. And you listen to black patients who say they feel pain differently than the index says. And what you end up with is research that shows, hey, the patients are right and we should be measuring pain differently. And so I think in combination, those two um, make, can make a big difference. Um, and since I'm from outside of, of the health sciences, I will happily say that I think there is so much to be done from a variety of fronts, whether you're a writer or a communicator or you're a journalist or you're a political scientist or you're a historian or you're a sociologist or you're an anthropologist or you're an economist. There are so many lenses that you can use to address this problem and so many communities of people throughout the country working in different areas that all touch this problem. And I think all of those have, um, they're not gonna have as directive effect on a patient, but they're still gonna have a really meaningful impact. And I think I'll end just by saying that I totally agree with um, what was said and um, just want to say that you, everyone on this listening, attending this panel, you are the drivers of change and it's really up to you to make the future more equitable health-wise and um, um, within the community. So it's really up to all of you. Well, you have your charge and we've come to the end. <laughs> uh, I think we have our marching orders and uh, it has been such a pleasure uh, to be uh, with uh, Dr. Bambanek and Dr. Claw and Dr. Bifos. Uh, you all have given such wisdom, shared so generously and openly, uh, and we are so grateful for all that you have imparted. And I know that we would, uh, all of us are gonna carry this forward uh, as we, again, continue to move towards the light uh, with much positive force. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us and for taking part uh, in this uh, Leadership Alliance uh, panel. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, at future sessions. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.